Okay, well, good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Walter. I'm the Deputy Director of the Earth and Planets Laboratory, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to our first installment of the Autumn 2021 edition of our Neighborhood Lecture Series. And uh, as you're all aware, we're not sitting in our auditorium, so it'll be clear to you that uh, we're still operating under COVID precautions. And we do that in order to keep everyone as safe as possible. And while we look forward to seeing everyone in person very soon, hopefully. Uh, we're also very pleased that you can join us here this evening, uh, even if remotely. So tonight's lecture uh, will be given by EPL staff scientist, Dr. Tim Strobel. Tim received his degree in chemical engineering at the Colorado School of Mines in 2008 and has been at Carnegie ever since, first as a postdoc and a research scientist, uh, and then as a staff scientist since 2011. So it's uh, Tim's 10 year anniversary. Uh, Tim's research is focused on synthesizing and characterizing novel materials for energy and advanced applications. I view Tim as an explorer, really an intrepid explorer who, who navigates a very complicated materials landscape, uh, trying to locate hidden materials that are just waiting to be discovered but are incredibly difficult to find. To do this, Tim uses a combination of theoretical and experimental tools uh, to explore this vast PT and composition space. And he is especially adept at looking for new and innovative processing pathways to locate exotic materials with unique and potentially very useful and applicable properties. Tim's particular focus over the past several years has been in extended structures rich in atoms like carbon and silicon and germanium. A good example of this is his recent discovery of super diamond carbon boron cages, where depending on what element you trap in these cages, the material has, uh, can have vastly different properties. Tonight, Tim will take us on an adventure that he calls How to Change the Freezing Point of Water and Other Curiosities from Between the Anvils. I'd like you to please remember to ask questions in the chat, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can along the way and in the Q&A after the talk is over. Um, and so with that, Tim, I'll ask you to take it away. Thank you very much, Mike. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining me this evening as we take a tour of some of the recent research activities at the Earth and Planets Laboratory. And tonight, I'd like to talk to you about the concept of metastability. Meta comes from the Greek word beyond. So we're talking about beyond stability, like metadata is beyond data. And a metastable substance is something that can persist despite not being the most stable or favorable state. For example, if I look at this ball that's sitting in this local energy minimum, it will persist within this state until perturbed and reach the global thermodynamic ground state. And of the approximately 100 million inorganic chemical compounds that are known, it is estimated that one half of them are metastable substances. And similarly, of the hundreds of millions of chemical substances known, they are also metastable materials. We should also be very fortunate for metastability as the biological molecules that constitute our bodies would actually prefer to be carbon dioxide and water if given the opportunity. So before moving on with metastability, I'd like to discuss stability. And here we have what we call a phase diagram, which is a thermodynamic representation of variables such as pressure, temperature, volume, and composition. In this plot, we see pressure increasing on the vertical axis and temperature increasing on the horizontal axis. So at very high temperatures, substances tend to form gases. At very high pressure, substances tend to form solids. And in between, we have liquids. 
Now for a real phase diagram that you're probably familiar with, that of water, we see if we have a region of vapor, liquid, and solid ice. At one atmosphere pressure, where we are in Washington, DC right now, we have water in the liquid state at room temperature. Thankfully, so I can quench my thirst as I become parched throughout this talk. If we're to cool this liquid water at one atmosphere, it will freeze at 273.15 Kelvin, zero degrees Celsius. Likewise, it will boil into a vapor state at 100 degrees Celsius. If, however, we could take this solid ice cube and it could persist at room temperature, we would call this a metastable solid. This, however, seems a bit unusual, as we all know, if we leave ice cubes out on our kitchen counters, they quickly melt into the liquid. Carbon, on the other hand, has a completely different phase diagram. I'll point to the same pressure and temperature axes, but do note the difference in scale. Here we're talking about tens of thousands of atmospheres and thousands of Kelvin. Graphite, which is the substance found in pencils, the writing substance, is the thermodynamically stable phase under normal conditions. Believe it or not, you can actually melt carbon and form a liquid phase at very high temperatures and even form a gaseous substance. Diamond is only thermodynamically stable at very high pressures. For example, 60,000 times atmospheric pressure is commonly used for diamond synthesis. But we all know that diamond can persist at conditions found at atmospheric pressure and room temperature. Therefore, diamond is probably one of the best known examples of a metastable material of which you can find evidence for by looking perhaps at your finger right now, your diamond ring. So why is this? Why is it that ice cubes when taken out of their thermodynamically stable regime melt, but diamond can persist? And it has to do with chemical bonding. So if you recall from your high school chemistry, water molecules are bound together by what are called hydrogen bonds, where there's a partial charge located on the oxygen and the hydrogen, which are uh, connected together through a phenomenon called hydrogen bonding. Whereas diamond is comprised of covalent bonds, a much higher and stronger energy scale that allows diamonds to persist. So going back to our analogy of a rolling ball, we can see that at room temperature, ice can easily roll down this hill to, to find more stable water. Whereas diamond has to overcome a large barrier to find graphite, despite the fact that graphite is in fact the lowest energy substance at room temperature. And we call this barrier an activation energy, where you can see this is very small for ice at room temperature, or perhaps non-existent and very large for diamond. And we can quantify this further by looking at what we call the rate of transformation or a chemical rate constant, which is given by this equation here, exponential dependence on the activation energy, temperature, and two constants, universal gas constant, and a prefactor. And if we simply make some assumptions of reasonable energy scales for those of hydrogen bonding, which would be the energy scale needed to disrupt the ice cubes into liquid, and breaking covalent carbon-carbon bonds to form graphite, which would be on the order of 10 or 400 kilojoules per mole respectively, we can see that this exponential term has a difference of 68 orders of magnitude indicating that the rate for carbon decomposition is extremely slow. We can formalize this by assuming a first order rate law and compute what we would call the half-life, which is the time that it takes for half of a substance to decompose. And in the units of seconds, we can see 10 to the 69 seconds is, is vastly longer than the age of the universe, uh, which explains why diamonds are so persistent. A warning, however, is that these calculations are done at room temperature. Do not leave your diamond ring on the stove as this exponential equation will quickly give way to increased temperature and graphitization of your ring. And one thing that I really enjoy and am fascinated with about metastable materials is that there are so many of them. In fact, conceptually, there are an infinite number of metastable materials. And going back to our rolling ball anal analogy, each of them have a local minimum if we can only find a way to access it. Compared to a singular ground state, we have all these different metastable states with potential to be accessed. And to me, this raises a lot of really interesting fundamental scientific questions. For example, are there limits on what can be synthesized? What is the upper energy limit on this scale here? Are there certain rational design principles and ways we can control pathways to access these local energy minima and synthesize new materials? And what are the range and utility of the physical properties which these materials would present? Diamond, of course, is a metastable phase, 
but has some of the most interesting properties of all materials being the hardest known, highest thermal conductivity, and et cetera. And given the vast number of hypothetical but plausible metastable states, it is probabilistic, it is probably likely that the best material for a given process would be a metastable material compared with the singular thermodynamic ground state. Another example, going back to carbon, I'm showing here a histogram where the cumulative probability of known and hypothetical carbon allotropes is a function of formation energy relative to graphite, the thermodynamic ground state. And on this plot, you can see that graphite and diamond have approximately the same energy, but there are hundreds, if not thousands of hypothetical carbon allotropes that could exist at only slightly higher energies. As I mentioned, we don't know the upper limit of what this high energy could be, but as a grounding point, we know carbon C60 or the Buckminster Fullerene, which won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, exists at 400 milli electron volts above that of diamond. I'll point out that over 60% of these hypothetical allotropes are energies below that of the C60 molecule, suggesting that these could be plausible to synthesize. Two examples I'll point out, one 3D metallic porous structure or this non-centrosymmetric superhard material. And in addition to these, there are many other potential allotropes with very intriguing properties that are waiting to be discovered. And while there are many ways to access metastable states, one of the things that we specialize in doing in my laboratory is using pressure to tune what we call the energy landscape. So our ball that's representing these local, uh, the, the states that uh, are either local or global minima can be tuned sort of like this marble maze game you may have played when you were younger, where you can rock the ball and locate different states. And by increasing pressure, we can tune the energy landscape so that some states become favorable at high pressure or disfavorable and other states become favorable or disfavorable. So for example, at high pressure, this state here might represent diamond and become thermodynamically favored, or at low pressure, this state here in the center might become thermodynamically favorable. And as I mentioned previously, oftentimes it's possible to lock in one of these states once you release the pressure and quench a, a metastable material at ambient conditions. So you're probably wondering now how we generate these pressures. And I should mention the scale of pressure can be up to that of the mil millions of atmospheres. We use a device called a diamond anvil cell. A diamond anvil cell is a piston cylinder compression device where we have a piston and a cylinder that hold two opposing diamond anvils. Here you can see a diamond glued on top of a seat and a metallic gasket with a hole drilled in the center that contains the samples. When the piston and the cylinder are placed together and the anvils come closer together, simply by turning the screws that you can see on the top of the cell, we bring the diamonds close until they compress the metal gasket, deform the hole in the center, and thus generate pressure on our sample. And given that diamonds are transparent over a wide range of the electromagnetic spectrum, we can visually examine our samples under compression, use a variety of spectroscopic techniques to examine the structure and properties of the material under compression and in situ conditions. So now I would like to give you a demonstration of an actual experiment inside of a diamond anvil cell. But before we do so, I would like to give a quiz to see who's been paying attention at the beginning of this lecture. So right now you should see a poll on your screen with a question that says, what is the freezing point of water? And you can select one answer between zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 273.15 Kelvin. You can't trick me, it's all of the above. Or finally, it depends on where you live. So we'll give a couple more seconds here for people to complete the poll. I'm not sure if you can change your answer once you've made your selection. Looks like about half of the people in the audience have completed this so far. And I'll just give 10 more seconds. So if you're waiting to select your answer, please do so now. All right, sorry to the remaining 40 people, but you should be able to see the results of the poll now on your screen. Um, a couple people, five selected zero degrees Celsius, four selected 132, uh, four of 132 selected 32 Fahrenheit, and one person selected 273.15. And we have almost a 50-50 split between you can't trick me, it's all the above, and it depends on where you live. 
So before we actually go to the answer, well, let me phrase it another way. Let's do a live experiment to actually answer this question. And to orient you, we're going to compress a diamond anvil cell live for you right now. Instead of turning the screws on the screen, we're actually going to use a lever assembly, which is somewhat like a, le a lemon squeezer where you can get lemon juice out. And so we have a knob that will compress this lever, squeeze the diamonds together, and we've oriented a microscope lens on top so you can see live the sample and what's going on. So right now, I'll go over to the apparatus, which you can see here. So the diagram in the top right of your screen, you should be able to see the lever to increase the pressure, the diamond anvil cell, the lever arms, the microscope. And then here I have a camera and a monitor that I can see on the screen. Now you should see a zoomed in view of the sample on the right side of your screen, showing the diamond anvil cell, the metallic gasket, the hole drilled in the center that's holding the sample. What I've done is I've loaded water into this diamond anvil cell, turned this screw to increase the pressure, and what you see is a crystal of ice at room temperature. As you can see behind me, I'm not in a refrigerator. This is a crystal of ice that is existing right now at room temperature. And carefully, if I decrease the pressure by turning this knob, I should be able to melt this crystal into liquid water. And you'll see some deformation on the gasket edges, perhaps some interference fringes between the optical light. And very carefully, you can see this shrinking sort of getting rounded along around the edges. And similarly, by carefully increasing the pressure, I can grow a beautiful crystal of ice with lovely facets. Now, as Mike mentioned, unfortunately, we're in a remote presentation, but next time you're by the lab, I'd invite you to stop by. We can give you a live demonstration and you can have a contest to see who can grow the most beautiful ice crystal. So if you'd like at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session, we can play with this more and see if we can grow some different geometries of ice. So if you didn't, if you didn't pick up on the answer to the quiz, it, it depends on where you live. Um, and so of course, this is now a realistic phase diagram of water, we have our vapor phase and our liquid. Um, at one atmosphere of pressure, water will freeze at 273.15, which is the same as 32 Fahrenheit, which is the same as zero degrees Celsius. So that was the, the trick part of the answer in the question. Um, and if you go to 100 degrees Celsius, of course, you'll turn it, this into a vapor. But this line actually, while it looks vertical, it does have a slight slope to it. So for example, if you live at slightly lower than atmospheric pressures, uh, as people do in Colorado, for example, you have about 80% of one atmosphere, you'll have a slightly higher melting temperature of ice as you would if you lived on a different planet uh, with a denser atmosphere or the moon. Now, what we've done is we've compressed water at room temperature and we've bypassed entirely the normal phase of ice that you would put in your cocktails. We've gone through the liquid phase and grown a crystal of ice six. And there are many phases, solid phases of ice. We could go to higher pressure and make ice seven or ice 10 or cool and make any of these various other phases. Um, but as I mentioned before, the weak hydrogen bonds that connect water molecules in the solid phases of ice are not very amenable to forming metastable materials at room temperature. But now I'd like to turn to one of my other favorite substances, which is silicon. And here we see the phase diagram of silicon in many ways similar to that of water, where we have many high pressure phases. But this uh, normal phase of silicon, silicon one or DC, the diamond cubic phase, is really the paradigm semiconductor that drives all of our microelectronics and devices that we use today. It's a semiconductor, which means that it can control the flow of electrons within circuits powering these devices. And it can also absorb solar photons and convert them into electricity as we have in photovoltaic devices. Now, while this diamond cubic phase of silicon is so important to our everyday life, in fact, it has a valley named after it, you might've heard of it in California. 
that it does have some limitations. And I don't have time to go through all of these other so-called exotic metastable forms of silicon, but we've managed now to synthesize several of these that have complementary or superior properties to this diamond cubic phase and could someday be used in our technological devices. I'll give you quickly one example. You may have seen this before. This is a form of silicon that we discovered several years ago. It's produced at high pressure. It starts at high pressure by making a compound called Na4Si24. It's a channel-like structure that has sodium atoms trapped in silicon channels. This can be metastably recovered to atmospheric pressure, at which point we can remove the sodium atoms and we can now make a very pure allotrope of silicon. In fact, 99.99995% silicon in very nice crystals that you can see here for our high pressure experiments at reasonably large size scales. And one thing that's quite interesting about this particular allotrope of silicon is that it absorbs light much better than the normal diamond cubic form of silicon. So here we see the absorption coefficient as a function of energy for the normal diamond cubic form of silicon and silicon 24. And you can see that the silicon 24 absorbs light much more effectively than diamond cubic silicon. In fact, somewhat comparable to state-of-the-art thin film solar absorbers like gallium arsenide or copper indium selenide. So someday while we're still working on this, silicon 24 might be a useful solar energy material. But the reason I bring this up today is we're in fact going to think of this as a metastable precursor phase. So our hypothesis was actually to utilize silicon 24 as a higher energy metastable state. Going back to our rolling ball analogy, we know the diamond cubic is the thermodynamic ground state structure. But if we perturb silicon 24, can we access one of the other metastable states that we discussed previously? And so to do this, we set off to do high pressure diamond anvil experiments and loaded silicon 24 crystals in our diamond anvil cell. This is work, very recent work that was published this year by Tom Scheel at the Earth and Planets Laboratory. And once the samples are loaded, we're able to probe them using x-rays, which diffract off the crystals in the sample and give a fingerprint of the crystal structure of the material. So here at the bottom left, you can see these spots, which are from this, we're able to deduce the positions and structure of the atoms within each of these crystals. And we treat silicon 24 under different pressure temperature conditions. And when we heat this material up at nine gigapascals and 1200 C, in fact, this process works at room temperature, uh, sorry, room pressure at 300 C, we get an entirely different X-ray diffraction pattern indicating that we formed a different structure. In fact, you can notice that there's a six fold symmetry here, which suggests that this structure is hexagonal. And we were able to solve this structure and show that indeed it is a hexagonal allotrope of silicon called 4H. 4H is further confirmed by looking at vibrational spectroscopy, in this case, Raman scattering, which probes the individual vibrations between the silicon atoms in the structure, also serving as a fingerprint for the structure. And we can see that the 4H structure is diagnostic of several of these observed vibrational modes. In one view of the crystal, you can clearly see the hexagonal symmetry. And the other view, you can see the stacking along what's called the C-axis. And the reason it's called 4H is there are four repeat layers, A, B, C, B, along the crystallographic unit cell. We're also able to directly image the atoms within this structure using a technique called transmission -like electron microscopy. In collaboration with our coworkers in Australia, we were able to use a focused ion beam to create a very thin section of our recovered sample. And we're able to look at this in the transmission electron microscope and actually see the individual silicon atoms also confirming the structure in this 4H stacking sequence. With the assistance of ab initio calculations, we're able to quantify the energy barriers in a rolling ball analogy for why we see this transformation mechanism. And starting from silicon 24, which is already a metastable state, we calculate an energy barrier of 110 milli electron volts per atom compared to 279 milli electron volts going to diamond cubic silicon. Clearly, we can see that it's easier to go to the 4H structure. Physically, it turns out that there is a structural relationship between these two phases, which makes this process have a lower barrier. You can see the 4H atomic structure in green overlaid with the silicon 24 atomic structure in blue 
and translucent blue spheres that connect the corresponding atoms across this phase transition. Here's a short animation of how this phase transition occurs, and you can see that with minimal, well, perhaps not minimal, with a, a modest amount of atomic motion, we can see the transition to the 4H structure, which would require much more atomic motion to get to the diamond cubic structure. So we're very excited to have discovered a novel pathway to a new metastable allotrope of silicon. And we now have the first high quality bulk 4H samples. While not perfectly single crystalline, we have highly oriented grains available. And in terms of the properties of the 4H phase, they're actually very similar to the diamond cubic phase that's found in your electronic devices. For example, it has an indirect band gap near 1.1 or 1.2 electron volts, which is similar to diamond cubic silicon. However, there are many new opportunities now available to us, and this is spurring a whole new line of research. For example, under compression of the 4H structure or tension, or by doping the structure with other atoms, for example, germanium, we can tune the optical and electronic properties of the material much more than we could in the diamond cubic structure. For example, recently a similar material was uh, produced with silicon and germanium, and you could see the emit, this material can emit light at various wavelengths depending on the dopant concentration. Another very interesting application that we might see in the future for 4H silicon is what in what's called microelectromechanical systems or MEMS devices. These, the best way I would describe these is advanced micro machines, very sophisticated machines, which are typically made out of diamond cubic silicon. But one of the limitations is with the mechanical properties of diamond silicon and with the 4H structure, which has improved mechanical properties, we could actually make more robust MEMS devices such as gyroscopes or resonators that could power next generation MEMS sensors. So moving on now to the discovery that Mike had mentioned with our carbon boron cages, I'd like to talk about our clathrate work. Clathrates are polyhedral cage structures that where a, a host structure traps a guest atom or molecule. And this particular class of carbon-based clathrates, I like to call super hard, super strong, super conducting, altogether tunable electronic structure compounds with glass-like thermal conductivity. So we're very excited about those prospects. And in one particular aspect I'd like to talk about today is superconductivity. So you may have heard superconductivity before. It's an emergent quantum phenomenon that is really characterized by two very unique properties. One, is when a material enters a superconducting state, it expels a magnetic field, as you can see shown here with the superconducting material apparently levitating above this magnet that is chilled. And one of the potential applications of this is something like a magnetic levitation train where you could actually levitate the train above the tracks with minimal friction between the track, allowing for transportation at very high speeds. The other very interesting property associated with superconductivity is that of zero electrical resistance below this critical temperature. And while this technology is still being developed, some in certain circumstances it already exists, these are actual superconducting cables that can transmit electricity, but you can immediately understand that zero resistance transmission would make for dramatic improvements in our infrastructure grid, uh, resulting in much improved transmission efficiency. In addition, because we have zero resistance in this cape in this wire. This means we can apply much larger currents through our uh, circuits. Much larger currents would mean if we wrap these in a coil, we could make much, much larger magnetic fields. And in fact, superconducting magnets are used in magnetic resonance imaging devices, MRI machines that you may have used previously. So all of these together, uh, these properties together really make superconductivity an exciting property. The problem, however, is that superconducting transitions are often observed at very low temperatures. The original discovery of superconductivity in 1911 by Onis, who was liquefying helium at 4 Kelvin and discovered superconductivity in mercury, has progressed over time in materials we call conventional superconductors. These are materials in which the superconducting transi transition mechanisms are well understood. The current record holder is a material called magnesium diboride, which has a transition at 39K at one atmosphere. There are other classes of materials that we would classify as unconventional superconductors, such as cuprates. Um, YBCO is one of the most famous structures. You can go look up YouTube videos that will show you recipes how to make these at home. Uh, the iron-based superconductors 
The current record is about 160 Kelvin for this mercury, barium, calcium, copper oxide at 30 gigapascals. Nevertheless, the temperatures that these are operating at are still very low. You can see some benchmark temperatures, liquid nitrogen or dry ice compared to room temperature, meaning that for most applications, these are going to be impractical or very expensive. In the past several years, there have been a couple remarkable breakthroughs in high pressure physics I'd like to walk you through right now. And based on some of the work that we did in 2011, actually this was the first paper I published as a staff member at Carnegie, which is a host guest structure of hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide. When compressed to very high temperature, this will form a superconducting structure called H3S or a modified hydrogen sulfide. Drozdov and coworkers had shown that this enters a superconducting state at 155 GPA and 203 Kelvin, very high temperature. Additional recent work partially done at Carnegie um, and the uh, Yermitz group has shown the superconducting transition in lanthanum hydride as high as 250 Kelvin at 170 GPA. And very recently, a claim of quote unquote room temperature superconductivity, 288 Kelvin, a chilly room temperature at 270 gigapascals. Very remarkable and impressive results uh, pushing towards the holy grail of room temperature superconductivity. Uh, I will point out, however, I don't know if you can read this on the screen. If you go to the Nature website that published this paper, there's a, a warning now that says that this result is disputed. Um, so we'll have to wait and see if this is reproduced by an independent group. But nevertheless, these so-called superhydride structures have now extended conventional superconductivity to very high temperatures. And the beautiful thing about conventional superconductivity is we actually have a theory that can help us predict materials um, and we understand the physics of how these enter superconducting states. But of course, 1.5 million, 1.7 million, 2.7 million times atmospheric pressure is quite a challenge. And you have to wonder if that mag, uh, magnitude of pressure is in fact more challenging than the magnitude of the very low temperatures that are required here. When we examine the structures of these superhydride superconductors, we find that many of them, in fact, are clathrate structures. We can see, for example, the sodalite clathrate or variants of this in yttrium superhydride or lanthanum superhydride. And the same structures are found in the carbon boron clathrates that I've mentioned previously. And like the analogy of ice that I mentioned, we have weak bonds between the hydrogen atoms in this structure compared with strong covalent bonds in the clathrate structure here. So it begs the question, could we learn from the physics of these superhydride superconductors, but actually produce a high temperature superconducting phase that's recoverable and metastable at one atmosphere due to the covalent directional bonding? And last year, we published the first discovery of a carbon boron clathrate structure uh, in strontium boron carbon system, SRB3C3. You can see the cage stacking right here with alternating boron, carbon atoms, and strontium located inside. This is an actual animation of the synthesis, which we put inside the diamond anvil cell. You can see the gasket in the sample. And then we shine a high temperature laser, which couples to the sample very high temperatures. And we can synthesize the material. You can see the clathrate phase becomes shiny and metallic once it's synthesized. We've been able to solve the crystallographic structure using diffraction techniques and can place all the atoms in the crystal. And this phase is stable above 50 gigapascals. And we've also been able to show that because of the strong covalent bonds, we can recover this phase to one atmosphere. Here we see an X-ray diffraction pattern taken uh, after it was recovered from high pressure. And I'll flash this slide briefly for the, any experts in the audience, but this is called the electronic band structure of the material which shows that we have a whole conductor and part, we have partially filled sp3 bands in the structure, as well as a moderate density of states at the Fermi energy, both of which suggest that we could have potentially high temperature superconductivity. And we've calculated this actually and come up with a range between 30 and 40 Kelvin at one atmosphere, which would be competitive with the record holder MGB2, which is 39 Kelvin at one atmosphere. In order to make these superconducting measurements, we actually had to develop a new experimental technique to achieve this. Unlike the superhydride superconductors, which readily re react with hydrogen at moderately low temperatures, boron and carbon are much more refractory elements requiring very high temperature heating, which creates a problem both for the wires that we have to add into the sample to sense superconductivity 
and because of the diamond anvils, which are very good thermal heat sinks. Our solution to this problem was to place sapphire crystals inside of our cell and place our electrical contacts on top of these sapphire crystals. You can see here one of the actual samples where we have the sapphire crystal and electrical probes loaded with the sample. Then we can do x-ray, tomography, transmission, radiography, and diffraction mapping. Here you can see the platinum electrical contacts, and we shine our infrared laser right into the center of this area here. And this x-ray diffraction map shows that we have synthesized the SRB3C3 clathrate in the center of the, the diamond cell between our electrical probes. One limitation, however, to this approach is that we are unable to heat directly at our electrical contacts and therefore unable to synthesize superconducting phase in direct contact with our probes. This means there will always be a resistive phase located in our sample, and we can never actually achieve zero resistance with this particular setup. Nevertheless, we can recover these samples and make electrical transport measurements. As we cool the sample and measure the electrical resistance, we can see at some critical temperature, we see a, a sharp drop in resistance. Sometimes the resistance goes up because of this resistive phase I mentioned previously. We also see that this resistive drop is, uh, there's no hysteresis upon cooling or heating, which is exactly what we would expect for a superconducting phase, unlike something like a phase transition, which could cause a similar drop in resistance, which, which we would expect hysteresis. We also see that the calculated superconducting transition here shown in this black line agrees very well with our experimental measurements for this kink where the transition occurs as a function of pressure, further supporting that this is in fact a superconducting transition. With these results, it's very promising, but we're unable to conclude that this is in fact superconductivity because we have not achieved zero resistance due to the resistive phase, and we have not yet demonstrated the interaction with the magnetic field. However, for the first time in experiments that were conducted this week, I'm happy to share with you that we can confirm that this material is in fact a superconducting phase. We've taken our non-magnetic diamond cell, loaded this into a magnet, and performed the same experiments. With increasing magnetic field from zero Tesla to 18 Tesla, we can see that the superconducting transition is suppressed with increasing field. This is exactly what we do expect for superconducting behavior as increasing magnetic field destroys superconductivity up to a critical field which completely, at which point superconductivity completely vanishes. So we're very excited about these results and now can claim with confidence that we've discovered a novel superconducting phase. And while we haven't demonstrated superconductivity yet at one atmosphere, it's a very challenging experiment and the wires often break when you're decompressing. We hypothesize that the superconducting transition will be on the order of 30 Kelvin with strontium. We're now on a search to find the highest superconducting transition by replacing this with various, various elements on the periodic table and also replacing this and also synthesizing completely different clathrate structures. So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you today that metast metastability really is a door to novel materials which may be accessed using pressure. And I've demonstrated these two examples of a novel allotrope of silicon called the 4H structure, which is in addition to a previous allotrope that we've recently discovered. And through our discovery of these diamond-like carbon boron clathrates, which have many, many interesting properties, including high strength and hardness. And today I focused on a novel class of superconductors. I'd like to acknowledge all the people who helped make this work possible, including my current and former members of my research group. I point out Tom Scheel, who did a lot of the work for the silicon, 4-H silicon. Li Zhu, who uh, just started a faculty position at Rutgers and started a lot of the work with the clathrate materials. And Javier Rojas, who's a design engineer who helped actually uh, he helped with a lot of the graphics in this presentation and also helped design the experiment that we've shown today. I'd also like to thank collaborators at various institutions and thank the United States Department of Energy Office of Science and the National Science Foundation for funding this research. And I hope we have time now for some questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tim. I'm sure there's clapping going on. Um, we do have some questions here and I'll just, uh, I tried to answer a few. We'll see how I did. Um, okay, so the first one is, do you think naturally occurring folded proteins have a lower energy? So have a lower energy fold. So the natural fold is a metastable state. In other words, without breaking the protein backbone, is there 
a lower energy fold? Yeah, so, so this is a, a complicated question that's not with exactly within my domain of expertise, but I can say it, it, it depends to some extent how you define ground state. Um, so for a lot of proteins, they'll be metastable with respect to other compounds that could form from the elements. So a lot of times when we talk about metastability, we look at all of the elements that are in your system and find the ground state configuration of those elements, which in fact may not be a protein at all. It, it could be some extended form of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, whatever else is in the particular amino acid chain that you're, that you're working with. In terms of the particular fold, um, now these are also complex energy landscapes. And I believe that um, you know, the nat native structures, uh, folded structures are believed to be uh, at least local minima on the low, low energy pathways on a folding trajectory. Um, but uh, beyond, beyond that, I'm afraid I can't comment. Okay, next up. Um... A question, these exotic silicons, can they exhibit delocalized silica-silica bonds analogous to pi bonds in sp2 carbons? As far as we have um, observed so far, no. Uh, there, there may in fact be some exotic uh, structures that could exist at different pressure regimes, but all of the structures that we've talked about here are going to be localized sp3 bonding. Actually, I should take that back. I, you know, I, I wouldn't exactly call it pi bonding, but if you do go to high pressure, for example, um, at 10 gigapascals, we do see delocalized, more delocalized bonding um, in a structure called, and all, actually all of the metallic structures of silicon would have more delocalized bonding. So I take that back. We see localized in the ambient pressure metastable structures, delocalized bonding in the high pressure structures. So we have metallic beta 10, um, and then there's a hexagonal form and several other high pressure structures. Um, although I would not consider those to be uh, the role of the pi electrons, uh, like, like in carbon. Okay, so um, if you lower the temperature of water under high pressure, it doesn't form ice. So does that mean you can preserve food better? In other words, could you have a high pressure refrigerator? Um, I'm not quite sure I follow the logic. Okay, so... At higher um, pressure, the temperature that ice forms goes down. So, I, oh, oh, okay. So we're talking about ice one H. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so at high at higher pressure, the freezing would, yeah. So in the ice one H phase diagram, you have a negative melting slope. Mm -hmm. So at higher pressure, the temperature, the freezing pressure, freezing temperature is lower. Um, so yes, you could have a a, a colder uh, freezer at high, high pressure. That, that is correct. Although, you know, the, the, the return on the increased pressure for the amount of temperature that you would gain is probably makes that process impractical because the slope, as I'd shown you on that phase diagram is so steep. Right. Okay. Here's one. Um, are there metastable substances that could be used as a store of energy at scale? Um, yeah, I mean, I th it's a uh, it's a different, a difficult question to answer because it's so broad. But certainly, um, you know, if we if we're talking about energy storage, are you thinking more along the lines of chemical energy storage, mechanical energy storage? Uh, what type of energy storage are we talking about? Uh, you know, for example, um, we have energy conversion materials I'd shown with our silicon. There can be metastable structures that could be, you know, serve as um, as battery materials. Um, we can have metastable structures that can serve as uh, supercapacitors. We, so certainly um, energy storage is well within the, the realm of metast metastable materials. Okay, next up. Is it possible to make a bigger ball of carbon to hold larger molecules inside? So uh, I think maybe this is um, in reference to the cage structure that you see on the screen right now. And so, yes, this is a small ball of carbon. And then we do have bigger balls of carbon. Um, there, for example, is a pentagonal dodecahedron in one of the structures that we would like to make, or a tetrachi or a hexachi decahedron with 20 or 24 carbons. Of course, we have the C60 uh, molecule, which can hold um, atoms, you know, like argon, um, perhaps even larger. Um, and then you C70, I don't know what the, the highest carbon fullerene that is known, but certainly C70 is known. Um, so the answer to that is yes, and people are able to put larger things inside of them.
Okay. Um, next up, is this all on the atomic level or are there subatomic considerations? So this is mostly, I would say, on the atomic level. Uh, it depends on how you define. I mean, we're, we're not talking about nuclear physics uh, for the most part. Uh, we, we are considering electrons, uh, especially in all of our calculations that we do, um, which are based on electron density. But beyond that, we do not, we do not consider um, quarks or anything like that. Right. Okay, so what are the top global challenges that material science can help address? Wow, this is a very broad question. I mean, I think, you know, the short answer is that material science can address any challenge you can think of. Um, I mean, whether you're thinking about clean, clean water, accessible water, renewable energy, um, you know, pick, pick a challenge that we face and novel materials can help address um, all of them in some, in some extent. Everything, you look, just look around um, your, where you're sitting right now and um, you know, some material and some property, uh, you're looking at your computer screen, you know, these are all possible because of materials, novel materials and technological developments over time. So um, world peace, clean water, renewable energy, <laughs> you name, you name it. it. Yep. Okay. Um, what is it about the high pressure polymorphs of H2O that make them behave differently than ice one? Bond types or bond strengths? Yeah, so um, we still do see fundamental hydrogen bonding. And there's an interesting phenomenon called the symmetrization of the hydrogen bond. So uh, if you think of the position of one proton that's covalently bound to an oxygen, in ice 1H, that's going to be closer to the uh, oxygen atom that's within the same molecule. But as you go to higher and higher pressure, that proton there'll actually be quant at a certain point quantum fluctuations between the, the next oxygen in the structure. And at some point it will be indistinguishable which oxygen owns that proton. Um, we also see other effects um, still within the realm of normal hydrogen bonding that are due to changes in packing, um, changes in entropy orientation. There's also uh, effects called dynamical and static disorder. So whether or not if you quote unquote look in the structure, does a proton exist at one site or multiple sites? Is it spinning in the structure or is it static? Um, so a lot, lot of different features we can see within these various phases of ice. Here's a tough one that I wanna know the answer to as well. When do you predict a room temperature one atmosphere superconductor will be discovered? I mean, Arguably, if that nature paper is correct and you consider 288K as room temperature, that feat has been achieved if we can uh, see that reproduced. So one atmosphere is the real challenge. Um, and, you know, I, I hate to make any prediction because, you know, if I could predict the future, I probably wouldn't be sitting with you, you here today. Um, but, you know, using some of the strategy, we, we know a lot of the fundamental properties now that drive these superconductors, particularly with the, the phonon mediated conventional superconductors. So one of the fundamental questions that we're trying to address now is can we use some of the features that we've learned with, for example, with hydrogen by using other light elements? Uh, I didn't share these results today, but we believe we can get up to approximately 100 Kelvin using some of the strategies that we've outlined uh, in conventional superconductors with carbon and boron in one particular structure type that we've been investigating. Um, now, you know, could we start adding lighter elements like hydrogen inside of that? Uh, those are some directions that we're thinking about moving in the future. Um, so if we, let, let's say we can do hundred Kelvin in five years. And um, if we can, if we can um, add hundred Kelvin at the same rate, then, um, then we'll give it, I'll give it 15 years, so. There we are. We're, we're going to hold you to that, Tim. Um, your samples are very small. How can the synthesis of a high pressure phase be accomplished to make materials in the quantity that would be needed for, say, electric transmission lines? So one of the, I'll give you two answers to this question. Um, if you can see the slide. So yes, this is the very small sample, uh, you know, 100 micron size or smaller scale in the, within the diamond anvil cell. We also have much larger diamond anvil cells um, that, you know, can, we can get samples on the orders of, uh, you know, hundreds of millimeters cubed. 
We have industrial sized presses that are sitting in our basement in the laboratory now, which we can get up to uh, centimeter cube size scale. Of course, there's a trade off with pressure. Um, and you know the industrial diamond synthesis occurs on the scale of about six GPA. Uh, under these conditions, there's about a million kilograms of diamond that are produced every year. Um, so depending on the material, this can be industrially feasible. This is a profitable industry. Every drop of oil that comes out of the Gulf of Mexico is drilled with a drill bit that has diamond coating on the tip. Then, you know, there are high pressure factories that really do use this technology at scale. So this is a cubic press facility that has, you know, football field scale of presses that just churn out high pressure diamond um, for use mostly for abrasives. Ideally, you know, so it, it, this can be feasible depending on the pressure. If you have a material that we can get down to say six gigapascals, we could make transmission lines. You know, I, I okay, maybe I won't say on some scale, maybe not to supply all of the world's transmission lines. Um, then the hope is that by learning how these materials actually work, we can come up with secondary processes that don't require as much pressure. So I didn't talk about this today, but another metastable way to produce diamond is actually at vacuum, very low pressure. This is called chemical vapor deposition. This technology was actually developed at Carnegie. These are diamond plates that are growing inside a chemical vapor, de vapor deposition chamber. We have a thin wafer of diamond and we're actually able to grow, you know, 10 millimeter large multi-carat single crystal diamonds that we actually can then use in our experiments. So um, yes, high pressure, higher the pressure, the smaller the sample. Um, but if we have a certain range of pressure, industrial feasibility does become possible. And then there are oftentimes alternative routes such as deposition that can eliminate the variable, variable, variable of pressure altogether. But you do need to discover the material first. If you don't know that a diamond exists, you can't think of a way to make it without pressure. Right. Okay. Um, and by the way, if you wanna see another uh, crystal in the uh, microscope, we can try to freeze water again. Um, Okay, with this question, would life exist with motion at lower temperatures at higher pressures? Um, so there are there is a field. Um, some of our my colleagues uh, at the Earth and Planets Laboratory would be better equipped to answer this field, but it's uh, it's called extremophiles, and there are organisms, for example that would live at much lower temperatures, higher pressures, or higher temperatures, higher pressures. Um, I don't know necessarily what that trade-off would be um, to, to say anything about the, the suitability of life. Um, I mean, most things are optimized in the conditions that, they're, uh, that they exist in, so they evolve. Um, but um, it, is, it is possible for life to exist under moderately extreme conditions. Okay, next up. To make magnetic confinement nuclear fusion practical, what kind of superconductor do you ideally need? Um, so I don't know the magnetic fields that are required for magnetic confinement fusion. Um, so we're ta what he's talking about is you know, extremely high magnetic fields that could actually force um, systems to, to, to create fusion. I know there are some prototype designs um, and I, you know, I don't think this is ever any practical design has obviously not been demonstrated. Um, but, uh, you know, very high current, uh, very high magnetic field superconducting magnets is my general comment. Okay. Uh, does crystallization of ice follow a classical or non-classical pathway? Non-classical meaning coalescence of nuclei and clusters. So as far as I um, have followed the ice literature, um, crystallization of ice, at least at, from, from normal conditions, there might be there's some, some other interesting uh, phase transitions that occur at much lower temperatures, um, does follow classical nucleation theory. And um, the evidence that I'm aware of that is uh, direct observation of ice nucleation in molecular dynamic simulations where they can uh, use classical nucleation theory to completely model that process. Okay, I think I've come to the end of the questions. Um, if there are no, no more, we can thank Tim again for a very provocative and exciting lecture.
And um, did you say that you wanted to go squeeze the ice some more? Is that something we if can- people, If people are interested, I can, um, I can show you what happens when you actually freeze the ice. Let's do it. So we have a, this crystal and the, you know, the danger of doing a live presentation without starting with the crystal is it's a little tricky to control the pressure. But let me just completely melt this ice. Okay, it's gone. This is liquid water. Now this is going to happen quite fast because one thing I didn't mention is that typically the transition does not occur. This goes to nucleation theory actually does not occur exactly at the phase boundary. The water in your freezer doesn't freeze exactly at zero degrees Celsius. There's goes to much lower temperature, overcome the nucleation barrier. So we're actually gonna have to overpressurize this beyond the phase boundary, perhaps even close to the ice seven regime. And when I get to that, you're gonna see probably a flash on your screen and you're gonna see the entire sample. Did you see that? Yeah. That yeah. was the entire sample forming ice. And ice is also quite a transparent material. So it really looks just like the liquid. But now as I release the pressure, when this starts to melt, you'll see grain boundaries. I wanna be careful I don't over do this. So you lose the ice very quickly. You can start to see those fringes on the outside of the gasket and that's giving me an indication and I'm getting close to the pressure going down. Maybe I start to see, yeah, so there's a crack. You see that? Yeah, yeah, there we go. So now, now you can clearly see the ice grains and I can sort of tune the pressure now. So now these are many, you know, hundreds of crystals. Oh, almost lost it. And if I'm very careful, I can go back to the state where I had one crystal kind of helps if you pulse the pressure a little bit, you can shrink, grow. When you get that surge of pressure, you get those nice facets on the crystals. And again, if you're, when we're able to have presentations in person again, um, it's a real fun exercise to try yourself and who, see who can grow the most beautiful ice crystal. And by the way, so ice six is a tetragonal phase. We might see that symmetry present itself in these crystals. And if I'm very careful, I can get one again, but maybe I won't get greedy. See if I'll, I'll stick with four. Okay, four mm -hmm. crystals. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> so thanks again, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. All right, thanks everyone. And I should remind everyone that um, please tune in on for the next neighborhood lecture, which will be on October 26 and presented by um, staff scientist Anat Shahar. Um, and the title will be What Makes a Planet Habitable? So thanks so much again, Tim, for a fantastic lecture. And we look forward to seeing everyone again next time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.